Very happy to welcome our next speaker. She's local. She's uh, here with us for uh, quite a long time, being our host on our events. So please welcome Barbara Ruschin. And finally, she's here as a, as a speaker. So she represents one of the Slovak banks as a chief ex, uh, experience, experience officer, running a, uh, a group of people, interesting people, UX designers, uh, customer experience designers here in Košice, our neighbors here in uh, Bravo Hub, I already mentioned in my presentation in the morning. And I'm really keen to see what you have for us. Thank you, so, Mikhail. Thank you very much. Enjoy. So this is a very funny moment for me, A, because I'm usually the moderator, uh, which clearly I lost that job today. Um, but also, if you, I, I was watching the lineup of the speakers ahead of me, um, and it reminded me of one of the exercises that my son would uh, bring from kindergarten, where you have like a list full of pictures or of like objects and it would be like can you spot the one that's different than the others and it would be like a picture full of you know fruits and then there's this one carrot in the middle that clearly doesn't fit um and and, and that's a little bit uh, the position that i have today i am by no means um an architect an urban planner a placemaker at least not by occupation um, I do know, though, a thing or two about um, designing experiences, because that, that's something that I do as an occupation, at least for, for the last few years. Um, um, as Michal already said, I lead um, experience design in, uh, in a bank, in a Slovak bank. Uh, we're a big Slovak bank for Slovak sizes, right? But we live in a country of less than six million people, so it's not necessarily an economy of scale. Um, but, but we are a very progressive and digital bank, and you probably know us um, if, I, yeah, if, if I show you um, the, the logo. And I'm not sure if you see it. Do you see anything on that screen? That's going to be fun today. Uh, so there is a logo of uh, Tatra Banka, which is the bank, <laughs> imaginary logo of the Tatra Banka, which is the bank that I represent. Um, as Michal already said, we sit here in the Bravo building, in the Bravo hub. Uh, because the people that, are le that I lead are not necessarily your typical financial people, right? They're not your bankers, typical bankers. If the logo that you don't see is what represents the financial people, then this is the logo that represents my people. And what you're missing behind that is kind of an X behind it. Um, this is the logo they created themselves. Um, imaginary X behind that. Um, uh, because experience is what, what we design. Um, and, and we're a very different group of people to most of other people in the bank, and we kind of bring a different perspective on how, on how to uh, create design and research um, experiences in, in financial industry. And when I was thinking about what is it that I'm going to talk to you about, because I'm the carrot, uh, but then again, you know, an occasional carrot in a fruit juice might be interesting, um, I was thinking that I need to find kind of a narrative structure that's going to help me frame the ideas that I have, um, and most of them that I learned over the last few years of designing experiences in the bank. Um, and I couldn't find one. And I was looking through um, my, my library, and there was a book, Still Like an Artist. So I was like, maybe I just should steal something, all right? And, um, and, and use a structure that somebody else already uh, test-proofed. Um, but it's going to be very easy today. Uh, I'm going to talk about. These three words, this is the name of the department that I run or the unit, the business unit, experience, design, and research. Um, and I loved what Charles said today in the morning. He said that we use a lot of um, words or notions. And A, they deteriorate the more we use them uh, and, and the, the quality behind them. But also, we don't usually explain what we mean by them. We just assume that other people think it's the same thing that we think it is. Um, and then we kind of get lost in translation. So today, I'm going to keep it very simple. I'm going to look at each one of those words and tell you why I I'm so obsessed with each one of those and why I think that they also relate to you no matter what is it that you do. And if you consider yourself a placemaker or not, or, or uh, you know, a designer or whatever, why a lot of that really applies to your everyday life. And I did eventually steal from an author that is very, um, not really intuitively, I would steal from this author. Let me put it that way. Uh, we, we do find ourselves on a very different spectrums of thought. Uh, but I love the cover uh, because it really is about um, some 12 observations that I want to that I want to share with you today. Four for each of those words, so for experience, for design, and for research. Um, 
and, and I love what they said about me on the cover, so uh, I figured I'm just going to use that. Uh, I'm not quite as confident with my observations as Mr. Peterson. I wouldn't call them 12 rules for life. I would say observations. So I'm going to throw a few balls at you and catch whatever makes sense to you. Uh, but, but I feel like those are not just for design and for designing experiences, but they really are for life. Because, I mean, what are you doing with your life if you're not researching and designing the hell out of your life experience, right? Uh, so, so really, I think that kind of applies. And I'm going to start with design, the first word. And more and more things keep disappearing from my PowerPoint presentation or, or Canva presentation. So it's going to be so much fun today. Uh, but design is the word that I want to talk to you about first. And I'm going to go in the middle because I think that that word kind of holds um, the most important subject or object in that experience, design and research. And it kind of frames the, the game that we play in the bank, but also um, also uh, about the rules that I want to talk about. And um, I think as a general public, usually when we hear about design, uh, we have a tendency to think that it's about how something looks, right? Maybe because we're so in contact with uh, kinds of design that are virtually very, uh, visually very stimulating. So be it like fashion design or interior design or product design, or uh, when we say designer jeans or a designer car, it automatically makes us think about how something looks, right? But those of you who are designers know that that's not necessarily what design is primarily about, right? Form follows the function. Um, so it's not just about how something looks and how something feels, but primarily about how something functions. And that's what designers are primarily responsible for, is design things that function well, that serve the purpose. And the moment you start thinking about it, you start noticing that a lot of things in life are very not well designed, right? That people don't always think about how to design well. And we talk today a lot about public spaces. And if you start walking around public places with your eyes open and you start looking at how things are designed, a lot of our public spaces design not very well. Because I lead a lot of UX designers, I started doing this. I just started collecting different UIs um, to see you know, how people design digital spaces, and it was just like, <laughs> right? and, it, and it makes you think. Um, and, and at the beginning, you start thinking, who's on the other side of that process? Like, what was happening to you when you were designing this communication window that you thought, this is good, right? And you let it out to the world as the testimony of your good work. Um, and, and for a long time, I was really unnerved by the bad design that I saw everywhere and made me think about who these people are and what are they doing with their life. Uh, but it's really not them. Most of these people are pretty nice and pretty cool. Um, I think the problem is that they are really just a product of a system. And it's a system that for many years was breaking down very complex tasks into a lot of tiny silos, right? So it's very hard to build a rocket from beginning to end, um, or, or a shoe, for, uh, as a matter of fact, right? from raw materials. Um, what makes economics of scales possible is the fact that you cut those processes down to very little and tiny, biteable pieces. And suddenly, you have a person that can do it that doesn't cost much, that it's easy to replace, uh, that you don't have to, doesn't have to be super educated. Um, it's what allows us to achieve a lot, but also, it creates a process where these people who create or work on as a part of the chain don't know what was in front of them or what's coming behind them. They almost never see the product as it functions in reality when it all comes together. Therefore, those tiny little silos then create uh, moments where the final product just doesn't serve um, the purpose or it, it is hysterically wrongly designed. Um, and so it's not necessarily that the people who are designing or are part of the process are completely dumb. It's the process itself is designed so that the outcome is not necessarily pleasing. And, and that's how it happens, that it's somebody else who picks the fabric, and then it's somebody else who picks the print, and then somebody else takes that printed fabric and creates a product, and then somebody else packages it at, and then somebody else sells it to you, and then you come home and you die, right? Because your bedroom just doesn't look like a flowery paradise. Uh, it looks like a horror scene, right? And I'm sure the flowers are great, it's just 
the context of what they're put in and how they're being used is what makes this a hysterical moment, right? So when we talk about design, the most important thing for me and one of the most important learning was that you really need to look at the whole context. It's the context that, and your understanding of the context and creating for that context that makes ultimately at the end your product either good or bad. And design is great because it introduces a process and that if you really follow that process, um, the, the probability that what comes in the end is gonna be substantially better than the pictures you saw before is very, very high or substantially higher than if you just do it um, as, a, as a waterfall uh, kind of generic process. Because it forces you to understand the problem first before you try looking for a solution, because it forces you to do the research to collect the data, uh, it forces you to try a lot, and it constantly holds you in touch with the final user with whom you're testing, you're getting the feedback. So by the time you get to the end, you didn't invest a crap lot of time and money and resources into building something that nobody wants because that problem doesn't exist because that doesn't solve the actual problems that are out there. So I'm a firm believer in the process itself and I believe that um, a lot of things, if we would do them properly uh, using and leveraging the design process could be substantially better, including uh, the products and the services in our life and our public spaces. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a theory that's a little bit more complicated, but I'm going to make it super simple. It comes from, um, I, I think Nettie Oxman was uh, the one who published it first uh, from MIT Media Lab. Um, and it helped me understand where design is. Um, and it's going to be important for some of the lessons that I'm going to talk about later. Uh, they created these metrics where they look at perception versus production and culture versus nature um, and talked about the full circle. Uh, and, and I want to show you where design is there because it helped me uh, put some concepts in my head. So I'll start at the beginning where science observes and experiments with information that it can get in the nature. And then by processing that information creates knowledge. Right? And then engineering comes and takes the knowledge that comes from science and turns it into utility, into something you can use and you can have uh, a benefit of. And that's where design comes. Design should take that utility and then turn it into behavior. Right? And this is gonna be important, so I'll get back to it, but I know you wanna know how the circle ends, if you're at least a little bit like me. Uh, so they place art in the last sector and they say, art then observes behavior from a very different perspective and can change it again um, into a new kind of information um, and, and the process starts again. Uh, if you want to see how beautifully it looks, if I don't draw it, by day draw it, this is how it looks. And, and there is a, a lot of other layers that you can um, look at that, uh, that process into. Uh, but this was an important recognition for me that design is something that takes utility and turns it into behavior because that means design has immersed power, right? And it's a power we need to acknowledge if we're designers, by occupation or not, or accidental designers, because each one of us is an accidental designer, at least, and something. So my lessons, um, and four lessons for design or for observations for, for, for design is, because it's not just about look and feel, we need to understand that design is a noun, but it's also a verb. A noun, which is the form, comes pretty late in the process. You already, the idea already lived for a while before you put it in a specific form. The verb is much more interesting. To design something means to go through that process. Um, and, and that usually gets you fantastic results if you're really good with the process, right? So to design things means to really be aware of the whole process from the beginning till the end, and then create a form that follows the function. And to me, that was super important uh, because I stopped focusing just on the form, but more on the function. If you understand the power behind the design, you need to take responsibility. There is something that you're designing, even if you don't call yourself a designer. You design cities, you design places, you design your workplace, you design your home place, you design uh, the way how your family operates, you design how you operate yourself, you design. Design is really nothing else but a creative problem-solving method. So there's no way you're not a designer of something. And you need to understand the power that is behind design. 
Um, and I think that we need to take the responsibility for the things that we're putting out there in the world because they have impact. And part of the problems that we live today is the fact that people don't assume responsibility for what they've designed. They just create something, let it out into the world, and don't worry about it anymore. And that we live um, in the world that we live, live in. Um, I left this point. Um, it's um, actually the Rule 12 from Good Services from Lou Down. Um, uh, you might have heard about Lou Down and, and, and the work uh, they have done with um, UK Public Service. Um, there's 15 heuristics for good services and what constitutes a good service. And I loved number 12. Number 12 says you should design things that encourage the right behaviors from everybody who comes in contact with the service, with the place, with the product, with whatever it is that you're designing. Um, and I think that this is part of that taking responsibility, right? It's understanding. I'll usually use a very corporate example because, you know, I'm a corporate animal. Uh, but imagine like a very simple corporate policy that somebody created is if you don't use up your budget by the end of the year, then we're going to cut your next year's budget because clearly you didn't need it. Do you know what happens at the end of the year in all of the corporations? Like, people buy things that would stop your brain, right? Nobody's dumb. Nobody wants to lose the budget next year, so everybody's going to use up their budget that year for no matter what, you know? Um, because it's a process that forces people or encourage a behavior of bypass, uh, a wrong behavior. And I think this is specifically valid in public policies, is do we create policies and do we create spaces that kind of uh, motivate people for the right behavior? Or do we create obstacles? Do we make things hard? Do we make things unpleasurable? Do we make people look for bypasses and workarounds, uh, which then have a terrible impact on the places that we live in and the policies that we live? So I, I thought that's, that's an important lesson that I learned as well. And of course, Dieter Rams, right? Design less, but better. We're cluttered. I understand that people feel the need to design and, and do things, and, and that's great. Uh, but maybe we should not fall in love with everything that we design, and we don't need to put everything that comes to our mind out there. Maybe we should be more careful with the things we produce. Maybe we should be more careful even with words that we say. Maybe we should put a higher quality output out there in the world and understand that those, peop those things then live for, for, for long periods of time, and they clutter the live the spaces, the living spaces that we live in. Uh, so my fourth observation about design was, you don't need to design everything that you feel like you need to design. Think twice and only put things that are worth it. Um, for a while, I lived in LA. Um, I, I was working in show business, not, not as a singer or anything like that, I'm more in a production side. Uh, and there was a world famous producer uh, who made millions in, in showbiz, and he always told me, uh, you only invest in things that you believe are going to be a super hit. You never invest in something that's like, that's good. You know, because there are so many obstacles that the artist or that the, the work is going to run into that ultimately, if you start here, you end up here. You only go for the things that are shooting for the stars. That's the only things that have any kind of potential to survive it. And I think with design, it's the same. Only go for things that you really believe are great because they're going to live for, for a long time and just clutter the world that we live in. And every good design, and I'm moving to the second part, every good design starts with research, right? We, we heard from Martin here about how important data is. Um, and I thought that were a lot of important points there, and I'm going to bridge to some of those that, that you've just heard. Uh, but there's no way you're going to do a good design if you don't start with the research, right? If you don't start with data, if you don't start with facts. Uh, that's why the process starts with that. Understand the problem and understand who you design first before you start uh, creating ideas. And when I say understand and do your research, that means understand people, right? Because who you ultimately design for, you're designing for people. So it's not just dry data points you need to understand. You need to be a people person. To be a good designer, you need to understand how people operate, how they function. That means you need to understand their psychology and physiology. Uh, and it doesn't matter what kind of services you design, you're going to run into biological bottlenecks somewhere. You're going to run into psychological bottlenecks somewhere. Uh, be interested in what mental models are out there and how they change the way people operate in the world so that you, do, you design things that actually can serve people, right? That's where human-centric is about. It's putting the person in the middle, understanding that as your main subject, and then build around it, right? 
And when I say that, um, it, it's, I think it's ultimately oftentimes where we fail. Like we understand the subject matter or the core business that we do, but we forget that we also need to understand people in the first place. Otherwise, nothing that we produce in our design uh, can be successful. So my four quick lessons about that I learned about research, and, and we do a lot of research in the bank. I'm very thankful to the bank that I work for. Uh, Tatra is specifically very design-driven and, and very keen on believing in research. Uh, we actually run researches that span far beyond just testing UX flow or products or services or value proposition. Like for example, last year in summer, uh, we've used up the whole summer when our researchers literally like almost lived in 17 or 20 different households all over Slovakia for two months period where they would visit frequently and talk to people about how they think about money, how they feel about money, how their budget, um, how, they, how they live money, uh, so that we understand our subject, which is people and their financial worries, very, very good because then it influences everything we do for them in the bank. And I, this was a fantastic place where we started because truly without data, and those are of course not my ideas, and you don't see it there, but you will see it when I share the presentation with you. Um, I always use the name of the person uh, that, that used it. Most of these quotes come from uh, world-renowned data scientists. Uh, but really without understanding your subject, without having the data, without having the research, you're just a person with an opinion. Um, and probability that that opinion is not full of biases, is not full of generalization, is not full of the prism of where you're coming from and what your social location and what your education is, is almost zero, right? So without creating without data or, or, de or designing without data only means formalizing your biases, formalizing your generalizations. You really need to tap into the data. But I do agree with Martin in one thing, um, that cleanliness of the data, objectivity of the data, is, um, is a complicated thing. Uh, data is really not clear, but some, it's, it's always better to, to have some data than to have no data. So yes, it's not it's oftentimes dirty, uh, but it's better than no data at all because most of it is useful. What I think we need to understand as designers and researchers is that data never tells you the whole story. There's always something more that you can know about your subject or your core business. You're never going to be at the end of the story. And having that confidence at some point to say, OK, I know enough to design something that's valuable is a very hard skill, by the way, for designers and researchers to learn. But it's absolutely vital because good today is better than perfect tomorrow because tomorrow never comes, right? So um, I, I think that understanding the bias in the data and the fact that it's not clean is important, but also that doesn't mean you shouldn't be using any data at all, quite on the contrary. Now, even if you have a lot of data and you collect a lot of data, and that's what happened to us with that, um, I would say it wasn't a complete ethnography, it was more like a moderated ethnography that we've done last year uh, with those families, is you collect a crap lot of data, right? You have a lot of data on your table, and it's not easy then to understand what to do with the data so that you can operationalize it or productivize it, right? So um, it's really great to collect data, but where you need to really work with yourself and be it a public policy person or, or be an incorporation or, or wh whatever it is that you're designing is to learn how to draw insights from the data. The data is not going to give you the answer. That would be the easiest job on the world would be to collect the data that give you the perfect answer and then suddenly, ta-da, right? And you're the winner. That's not how world works. Data is going to give you a lot of options and it's, it's going to show you some directions, but you need to really work, A, on your intuition um, and, and really use the data to kind of push your intuition, but also uh, you need to be able to call shots and, and, and by, by synthesizing the data points correctly so that you really get the, the, the benefit of the data. Um, so uh, insights is what's really the real product that we're looking for, not just the data itself. The data is just a sub-product. It's the insights. Uh, that are important um, and, and that we're looking for if we want to design good things. Now, another thing is that you need to understand who works with the data, right? Like, we're also people full of biases, we're people full of confirmation bias. We look for data that prove that we have been right from the very beginning, right? And I've been victim to this um, more times than I would care to count. Um, Understand your own limitation, your own psychological bottlenecks. Understand that you're full of biases and confirmation biases, and you look for numbers that, which if you push long enough, and if you turn long enough, and combine long enough, uh, you can pretty much 
find data that proves any point in the world, right? So you need to be extremely, I think, disciplined in understanding where your limitations are. And that's why we also put multidisciplinary teams, multi-skills team, right? Very, we put diverse teams in the same room because those people have different biases. And none of them is true, but collectively, there is a higher probability that they will be, right? So understanding, I think, that is also important when you work with data. Don't torture it. Don't try to prove your point. We'll really try to look at what the data is telling you and then act on top of it. And I'm getting to my last point, I promise. Experience. Uh, and I think experience is super important to us uh, because uh, when I remember 10 years ago, most of the designers I knew, they were graphic designers. Like that was the designer that I knew. Today, we have interaction designers and we have UX designers and CX designers and brand experience designers and all kinds of designers, like the proliferation of design everywhere, right? And one thing that connects at least the people that work in my squads are, is the X, that's the experience. Um, and it's been written a lot about what experience means and we also have been talking about experiencing public places and experiences, experiencing uh, services and products. Uh, but I think that this is one of the words that specifically falls victim to what Charles was saying. I think we all imagine something else on the other side of what experience is, right? And the common definition of experience is that it's a 360, right? It's a 360 of a brand or a public space of whatever. It's everything that a user kind of comes in contact with when it comes to your brand or, or your service, right? It's the 360. And it's probably factologically true. I think that is what experience is. But also, that is hysterically flat. <laughs> yeah, that, does, that doesn't tell you much. It's just like, what's experience? Everything. Yeah, but I mean, what everything. Right? How, do you, how do you work with that? Right? Like, what do you do with that? So I was looking for a concept over the last four years that would help me kind of understand better what is that experience design that I should be doing with my people and, and, and what is really on the front, front, front of that. And um, what helps me a lot, and, and that's another model, I'm sorry, uh, it's economic progression uh, or progression of economic value, right? And that helped me kind of understand really well of what we mean by experience and why not everybody who says they create experiences actually create experiences and why not every experience matters um, the same, at least. So you start with commodities, right? There's a very low differentiation. There is a very low price point. I'm going to be talking a little bit from a corporate perspective now. But it applies generally, right? So you start with commodity. Anybody can extract commodity. Um, there's not very much differentiation. Uh, the costs are relatively small to more complex products. So you start with commodities. And then if you customize wells based on research and design, you get goods, right? So you make a coffee out of coffee beans. Um, and the price point is rising. The customization towards the client is rising. Also, your differentiation as a, a, a person or a company or an institution that has been working on the good is more complex, much harder to copy. Uh, but you're still pretty much on the low level of, um, of, of the spectrum. This was the Industrial Revolution, really. And then the 90s, right? And plus the service economy. So if you customize that product a little bit more and you cover it in another layer, you get a service. And a lot of experienced designers are actually designing, optimizing services, which don't get me wrong, is a fantastic thing. You cannot really build an experience on a wrong service. And I'm going to tell you shortly why. But it, that's not the experience. That's not what we talk about when we talk about experience. Experience comes when you customize service. It's a higher level. It's more, right? Uh, buying a coffee in a coffee shop is a service. I come there, I get my coffee, I pay, I leave. A, an experience is, and you might like it or not, but it's Starbucks, right? I walk in there, I know that I'm in Starbucks because experience experiences are how we do branding now, right? Like I know this experience is distinctive to the other experiences in other coffee shops. I know that I'm in Starbucks. I know what that means. I, I can, even if the logo wouldn't be anywhere, I would know, right? Because they push the service to a whole new level by creating another layer on top of it. And I think these are the experiences that are the differentiating factor that we talk about right now. If you want to know how that progression goes further, because I know you know, uh, you know you want, to, want because you're our curious minds. If you customize experiences more, you get to transformations, right? Um, and, and, and they're what we 
ultimately are going to be trying to achieve um, in the next few years, and, and, and some companies already do. Uh, but that's how we go further. But when we talk about experiences, I want you to understand that it's not just services, it's not just flat products, it's something on top of that. And the first easy distinction of how you can uh, distinguish a service or a product from an experience is that services are delivered, but experiences are staged. There's one simple example I use because it always hits home and it's not necessarily appropriate, but I know it's gonna work. So when you come home on Friday night and you're, you know, you walk into your house and everything is nice and clean and in its place and you feel good that you're home, uh, that's not staged, that's a service. That's what happens on Friday night when you come home, usually. If you come home, you open the door, your partner stands there in a very sexy negligee with a rose in his mouth or her mouth. Uh, there are candles everywhere, everything smells nice, the dinner is on the table and music is playing. That's freaking staged, right? That's experience. That's on top of what normally is there. That's different from your traditional Friday. If not, kudos to you, and I'm a little jealous, uh, but that is staged. That's experience. You took something that was there and augmented the reality to build something on top of it, and that is the experience. So experiences are staged. They're more than just service or a product or a commodity. Good experiences are branding. That's the modern kind of branding. I should know that I'm in Starbucks. I should know that I'm you know, um, in, in whatever public, uh, I mean, service you're using. Um, it's like when I show you a yellow cap, you will know that I'm showing you New York without having to show you other things about New York. If I show you a black cap, you probably know, would know that I'm showing you London without having to see the rest of it. There are things that make you think of an experience that's immersive, and, and you know that, um, that that is the substance that's different from the others. So experience is really branding, and that's one of the hardest things, by the way, to do, because designing good services and good services in general are oftentimes invisible, right? If you really want to perfectly fit the needs of a user, your products often become invisible because they fit so well that they don't disturb the habits, the movements, right? All of that. So branding through experiences is super, super hard because that means you need to stand up in places where normally if you're good, you would be invisible. So it's a big science, but it's, uh, it's fantastically interesting. And when another thing that makes you distinguish uh, experiences from, for example, services, is um, that experiences are time well spent. Unlike services, the reason why you use services is because it's time well saved, right? You buy the service because if you would have to do it yourself, that would take a lot of resources, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money. You would have to learn the thing in the first place, then you would have to have all of the things that you need in order to fulfill the service. It's just very costly. So you buy services, you purchase services, and people deliver services because it saves you time. Experiences, on the other hand, is time well spent. It's a place where you consciously spend your time because the experience is pleasurable. If we would go more further up that, um, that, um, um, uh, that graph, uh, transformations is time well invested, right? You invest time into Duolingo consciously because you know you're gonna become a more educated person at the end of that experience, right? That's a transformation. You invest time and money and resources into buying masterclass because if you watch them all, you're gonna be next Gordon Ramsay. So it's worth it, right? You're gonna be better at the end. It transforms you into a better version of yourself. And also when I talk about experiences, I wanna make sure that we understand that every layer underneath counts. You can build a good experience on top of a shitty service. You can have a good service on top of a shitty product. You can have a good product on top of a shitty commodity. And with this, um, I uh, say excuse me to all the translators that I had to translate that. But, uh, but that's how it works, right? Every layer is a baseline layer for the next one. You can cover tiny cracks, but not all of it. So asbestos might be a commodity that's not necessarily the best. Uh, and if you build, I don't know, a product like a roofing, element out of it, the service might be fantastic, but the commodity is shit and toxic, so the experience is not gonna be good. So you need to have all of that chain kind of covered if you wanna, in the end, create good experiences. And that's it, that's my 12 rules for life. Thank you.
Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. It was amazing, even without logos and whatever <laughs> was missing there. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, I might have a question first. That, okay, you come from a corporate world or whatever you presented was slightly touched with the uh, experience in corporate world. But how would this uh, imply for public service or public s services cities providing? So is there any bridge or lesson or advice you would give to people working in public service? Yeah, so I, I, the way I was picking those observations was that I thought, and clearly I didn't deliver on that, thought, but uh, I thought that they're also used to be in public space just as well as in, in a corporate world, right? So uh, kudos goes to you and the whole team because you cannot design good things if you don't have data. So started collecting data, understanding the data, but also understanding the limitations of that data and working with that data actively is step number one to creating good experiences in public space. And then if you want to have a good experience in the end, data is not going to do all the work for you. You actually have to go through a process of design that kind of keeps you in track to make sure that when you're designing, you constantly talk to the end user. You make sure that when that public service or place comes out, it actually serves the needs of your focus target audience, yeah. which is your citizen and, and their micro segments, right? And then that just optimizing services is not gonna cut it. I mean, that's a hygiene today. Uh, so the fact that I go to municipality to pay my taxes and I can actually do that, and in half an hour walk out with my taxes being paid, that's great, but I kind of was expecting that, right? I wouldn't expect less of a functioning municipality. So that's not experience, that's optimized service, that's delivering on the optimum, so where my expectations and the reality with the city meet. That's optimum, that's nice, but I would expect that in a modern city, in a modern democratic country in 2023, I expect more, I expect experience, I expect something on top of it that kind of takes into account of who I am and what I might expect from a city and delivers something nice and surprising on top of that. That's not gonna happen all over your customer journey, of course, because that's, you know, we all have limited resources, we have limited time, and it's not fireworks after fireworks after fireworks in services or in life. So you strategically, as a designer, pick places that are emotionally important to the user, and you stage your experiences there. That's where you do the fireworks. Okay. So you go through an optimal service, and then suddenly, ta-da, and then you go through optimal, and ta-da, and in the end, you're just happy, right? OK, and what's your favorite experience, except of Starbucks? <laughs> well, Starbucks is by far not my most uh, favorite experience. Um, um, so from um, digital interfaces, for example, I really like uh, Flow by Moleskin. I don't know if you guys are okay. using that application. Um, I just love how it works. I love how it looks um, and, 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 and what it does and, and how it can change colors. I used to be a junkie when it comes to notebooks and pens and pencils and colors and everything, and I would have a backpack full of those things. It's not a sustainable way of living, I want to say. Uh, um, but, but Flow kind of covers all of that for me, so I love that experience. Um, as a service, I really like Martinus, which is a, you know, okay. a common brand that we mentioned in Slovakia. I think the way they communicate. From banks, I like Monzo. I like the way they communicate with the, their very specific target of the audience, okay. I want to say. Uh, but the way they communicate is very human and relatable to me. So I like to see their communications. I didn't experience their products and services, so this is not a, a review for a bank. But, but I like how, they're, how they work and how they function, yeah. OK, thank you. Maybe one more question from the audience. Levente. Thanks. Thanks for the fascinating talk. Um, one of the key principles you mentioned, of course, design is something to, to change behavior or modify or shape behavior. And before we talked a lot about agency. And historically, a lot of design to, sh to change behavior was to make people believe they have agency, but actually take away the agency. So how do you reconcile these two things? How can you design something that is, doesn't close us into one channel of behavior, but still gives us options and empowers us? Right, so I, I wouldn't necessarily frame myself in a, as an expert for uh, design for behavior um, in, in, in that particular sense, but uh, the approaches that I really liked and we try to also leverage in the bank is, for example, like I love the fun factor. Like, um, so for example, and you know in Nordics that was very often, right? Like they would have the waste bins which when you throw thing in, it sounds like and then people would just like clean up the whole park because they want to hear that sound because it's funny, right? Or people would take stairs because they make sound as a piano, right? 
or Japanese are really good at that, right? Like people littering because they're coming from the bar at four o'clock in the morning. You don't want them to piss all over the city. So you just put a little a tiny pagoda somewhere next to the wall. And suddenly when they see the holy space, it kind of feels stupid to litter there, right? So they wouldn't, they would look for a public restroom. So I, I think that we shouldn't over engineer our thinking about that. I think it's the little tiny thing that make people um, adapt different behaviors. And, and for me, that is the most attractive part. But also, I love uh, Brian Falk, who runs the behavior design lab in Stanford. And he specifically talks about adopting new behaviors, right? So he says there is a difference how you approach if you want somebody to change a behavior only once, or you want to do it temporarily, or you want to do it for all life, if it's stopping or, stop, uh, or starting a behavior. So there's a whole, I think, approach to that. And we can be more uh, obscure about it or less. I like the obs less obscure approach is more uh, but yeah that that's how I would um, so I, I and I do understand what you're saying is that it kind of takes away or, or uh, kind of plays with the agency of a person if I uh, excuse my French if I want to piss at the corner of the building I should probably be capable of doing that and, and I don't think that takes your agency away I think that just kind of skews your thinking or brings different parts of your thinking up so that it kind of changes your behavior well Thank you very much. Round Thank of you. applause.